check, have a chance to play, right? Like I was making, I was making 425 bucks a week. Right. I mean, I, I got sent down to Nashville and I was a healthy scratch for the first 10 games. I remember, uh, I got on our first bus ride down to Tallahassee to play against the Tiger Sharks. And, uh, we had a full squad, pretty solid older guys, Dixon Ward, um, a uh, b- bunch of a uh, bunch of other veteran guys, right? And I was I was the guy that I was sleeping at the front with the our, our bus driver's nickname was Snake. He was wearing a Scorpions leather jacket, cut off sleeves. No joke, I'm not lying. But I was lying on the stairs as you know the Greyhound bus as you can get off. I was sleeping on those stairs, and I healthy scratch. But no, what I was back to your word, grateful. I was I was playing pro hockey, and um, you know I wasn't giving up. That was former NHLer, IHLer, AHLer, and East Coast Hockey League Hall of Famer Glenn Metropolit, and you are listening to the Up My Hockey Podcast with Jason Padola. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Podolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Podolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games, but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. All right, welcome back to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padolan. I am your host, Jason Padolan, and today we are at episode 87. And do I have a treat for you? Uh, our guest today is none other than Glenn Metropolit. Uh, Glenn Metropolit is born in 1978, and his hockey story is absolutely fantastic. Uh, lots of adjectives to describe it inspiring, unlikely courageous, uh, lengthy, uh, the, the list goes on and on, but Glenn, uh, has an unlikely story, mostly because of his upbringing, uh, where he started, which we get into in in the projects, as he called it in Toronto, uh, not playing competitive, uh, structured hockey, really almost his entire youth and, uh, playing where he could for free and ending up getting into a junior aid league um, getting getting recognized because of his performance, because he was a hell of a player, moving on to the pro ranks and, uh, and working his way up from league to league to league, eventually the NHL and a 400-game NHL career. Uh, there isn't many leagues that uh, Glenn never played in. He played till he was 42, a 22-year professional career. He played in, in Germany. He played in Switzerland. He played in Finland. Uh, he played over in uh, he played in the IHL, the old International Hockey League, the AHL. He played in the East Coast Hockey League, where he played two seasons there to start off, and he is now an East Coast Hockey League Hall of Famer. Um, again, in the NHL, this this man has played in a lot of different places. Uh, he played in the Spangler Cups, representing Canada, uh, and every place he went, he performed. Every place he went, he contributed. And, uh, and as one of those guys who wasn't a high draft prospect or wasn't considered to be slotted in on a depth chart anywhere, he earned everything that he got. He had to play the game the right way. He had to be a good teammate. He had to get things done on the ice. He couldn't take nights off because nights off for him meant demotion uh, or meant something, something else. Uh, it's not like he got, he got uh, nine lives everywhere he went. And, uh, and yeah, I just love his story. It's super inspirational. Uh, he's somebody that I thought was a fantastic player when I had the opportunity to play against him in the AHL. Uh, we faced off against each other when he was with the Portland Pirates, and I was in Lowell. A very creative player, played hard-nosed. He was gritty, uh, had a great hockey IQ, and could really get things done. And, uh, and to watch him progress up the ranks, and, and like I said, to play over 400 games in the NHL, essentially, I believe... The majority of his game started when he was 32 years old, uh, which, again, a highly unlikely story. So we talked to Glenn today for over an hour. Uh, he's now coaching in Switzerland, which, uh, which we get into, uh, but tons of great lessons here. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just really honored to share uh, today's guest, Mr. Glenn Metropolit. Enjoy. Enjoy. 
All right, well, here we are for episode 87 with uh, Glenn Metropolit. Uh, you guys have heard the introduction, a lengthy pro career. Um, I've been chasing Metro down now for Jesus. How long has it been, Metro? Like, we've been talking about this for probably a year now, I think. And uh, Yeah, bro, about a year probably. Yeah, I love, I love yeah. the uh, official honor of being able to welcome you to the podcast. So thanks for being here, partner. Thanks for having me, man. I'm happy to be here finally. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess just for context, maybe you can let people know uh, where you are right now and, and what you're doing. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually over in uh, Switzerland in the National League, uh, the top league. I'm assistant coach with uh, HC Davos, where the team um, had their 100th year anniversary last year. Um, I wasn't a part of that. This is my first year, but it's home of the Spangler Cup. People probably know in Canada where, you know, where the, the European Canadians come, put a team together, and we play over Christmas. So we're the host team. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, you had, and we'll get to your your uh, yeah. your career, but, you I mean, you definitely had some some experience there in the Swiss League, and um, and there's yeah. some names that I want to talk about, too, in your in your time there. But how is uh, – let's start with where you're at right now, just with the whole coaching aspect. I mean, long playing career, like into your 40s, mm -hmm. which is a absolute uh, remarkable thing to say uh, at the level you are still playing at. But uh, was it a was that something that you knew that you were going to get into? Like uh, after the playing was done, I'm going to I'm going to be behind the bench. Uh, I tell you, Treat Jay, I was um, my last two, my last four years in Europe. I kind of I separated with my ex, and my kids were back in Florida, and um, I, I had enough. You know, 22 year career, and I wanted to go home to uh, Destin, Florida, the North Panhandle there, and uh, kind of be with the kids. So. That's got, that was my plan. You know, I had a, had a gym that I was running. Um, I was a TRX instructor trying to build that franchise it. And then, um, doing some NHL alumni stuff, a couple tours across Canada, you know, charity events and stuff. And, um, then finally realized I, I got the itch again, you know, I had a couple of years off and then it was like, man, it's, it's in my, it's in my fiber. So. And how did you approach that? Like how, how was that? Um, yeah. You know, I know even even me, what I'm doing now, and you know, and I'm I'm getting involved with teams, and then the guests that I find, and you know, I'm mm -hmm. kind of revisiting this network of over 15 years ago, or what a you know what a 15 year mm -hmm. hockey career can do. Is that sort of what you were doing, picking up the phone and just letting you know, letting know, letting yeah. people know that you were interested? Well, no, no. What happened was I was up near Pensacola, Pensacola Ice Flyers. There's a I played in East Coast there, the Ice Pilots. So long story short, they Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay Lightning were up there doing like a school visit, you know, go and teach kids how to play hockey and stuff like that. And they're like, hey, Metro, you played a couple of games. <laughs> Do you want to come and uh, shoot a ball around with the kids? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, um, so that kind of just got the ball rolling a little bit with the Tampa Bay Lightning and then uh, doing a few camps. I went down to Tampa and then um, I had full custody of my son, uh, Max, and he was going into grade nine. So I was like, no, let's get down to Tampa, get back into hockey you know, the grassroots. And um, so we moved, made the move down there, which was a six hour drive from uh, Destin. Uh, the girls stayed with my ex and uh, they commuted, but Max and I went down to, uh, so I started coaching high school hockey, um, you know, doing some player development stuff on the side. Um, and then kind of just grew from there. You know, I was, I was coaching the lead high school hockey team, showcase team. And then, um, you know, I was head of uh, an academy, you know, in Tampa. And then, um, then my days in Mannheim in a DEL, one of my last years there, there was um, a skills uh, coach, uh, um, Andrew Leach. A Andrew Leach? Um, I'm probably saying it, butchering up his name. But anyway, he was coaching with uh, Team Turkey. Oddly enough, they, they play hockey in Turkey. And he was like, Metro, do you want to come? And, you know, you were good on the power play. Why don't you come and um, kind of help Team Turkey? I'm like, oh, man, great. No problem. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in this world now. You know what I mean? And uh, COVID happened. Two years went by he was older and um, rest in peace, but he ended up passing. Mm -hmm. So I carried on. I went to the world championships with team Turkey at division three championships, <laughs> which was pretty interesting. And um, we went there, had a good tournament. And then uh, I got back and I was like, no, what? I, I gotta, I gotta shake the bushes here call my agent and see if there's anything available out there. And so there's a few teams and um, HC Davos was one of them. The assistant coach went back to Sweden and I called Jan Alston. I don't know if you yeah. ran across Jan in Mannheim or whatever, across European hockey here. Yeah. Uh, um, so he's the GM. I knew the assistant, the defensive uh, G, uh, coach, uh, Walter Imonen. He was in Finland with me and in Zug. 
and I knew the the head coach a little bit. So I was like, man, let, let, let me uh, let me have a little Zoom interview with them. And I did it, not really knowing. I kind of just uh, open talk, you know, talking hockey and my thoughts on def- defensive zone coverage, power play, and and sure enough, you know, kind of they're like, yeah, we'd love for you to kind of uh, hop on board with the squad. And I'm like, okay, great, let's do it. And here we are now. I'm uh, I'm hockey found me again, you know, and I'm yeah. I'm, I'm really stoked. That's exciting, man. That's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's wild, right? Like, I mean, you, I mean, yeah, I mean, I saw the laundry list of teams, right? Like yeah. when yeah. when you're when you're up and down, like, and I was, and I can I can relate, you know, like there's so many people that you have touched, right? Like in one way mm-hmm. or another, whether it be coaches or players or, you know, I know yeah. I saw that you played with Jared Bedner. I saw that you played with Nat Domicelli, you know, like these guys yeah. that have yeah. moved on to do different things. Um, and it's nuts, yeah. right? Like, uh, and people yeah. remember good teammates and, and good people. So it's uh, it's nice. I mean, I've, I've been I've been blessed that that Betsy's been on my show a couple times, and you know, like these yeah. these players, uh, you know, it's it's just cool. Like the the hockey family's yeah. cool, and that and that's really that's really how it how it happens. You know, that that network of 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 what you've done in the past and who you know now, and and then helps open doors and opportunities. So good on you for being there. That's fantastic. I want to know more about Turkey though. Like, what would <laughs> What would a D three World Championship hockey like? What does that hockey look like? Well, well, first of all, I flew into Istanbul, so I felt like I was in a movie from Taken or something. You know what I mean? I'm just like, whoa. But uh, anyway, when I go to Istanbul for a week, um, I was really surprised by the individual talent of the players. You know, the skill level. You know, in practice, I was like, wow, man, okay, these guys are pretty good. But you know, we did power play for a week, worked on certain stuff, break ins, entries, exits. And then, um, sure enough, we get to the game. It was just the process, and they can't, they couldn't process it well enough. They're they're skilled, but it was the processing and the IQ was kind of where they lacked. But um, you know, putting on that that jersey, that what they were wearing for the country, they had so much pride. And it was just tight knit group. It was it was quite an experience, man. That is cool. Yeah. Who else yeah. is it? Like, what's a D three country in that? Like, who are the countries that are there? Um, who else was Luxembourg? Was one. Um, uh, who's the, uh, the Arabs, um, not Dubai or what, uh, Emirates, um, they're one, uh, who else do we have? I'm drawing a blank here, buddy. Um, yeah, no worries. Um, there was, was I, I kind of forget right now. So it's not Sorry even about. like, it, it wouldn't be Taiwan. Taiwan was a team. Yeah. You can imagine so like, that. Like, DCJ would be a better, would be better hockey than that. I, I think it'd probably be equivalent. Yeah, but, probably BCJ would be better. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, but probably give them a good game. Right. Yeah. That's, um, that's so, so and what do you I mean? But, yeah, that's when when I ended up in uh, in Mannheim, as you ended up in Mannheim, I was there for, for three or four years. Like, uh, yeah. sounds like it was kind of like when I went over for the first time, it was, it was in hopes of kind of resurrecting my NHL, you know, uh, prospects right i thought that i was kind of getting looked over and maybe was was becoming mm-hmm. less of a player and i wanted to get back in touch with being offensive and everything else and sort of reinvent mm-hmm. myself and come back sounds yeah. like that's sort of what you did but when i went over there it was like holy smokes like the hockey was good it was mm-hmm. fun um yeah. you know i found a passion for it again i was seeing a part of the world that i would never have saw otherwise uh mm-hmm. there was just uh it was quite an experience to say the least. And I can imagine, you know, mm-hmm. being in Turkey, maybe not to the same extent, but I mean, you're seeing a spot of the, of the world in a, in a way you've never would have seen it otherwise. Right. Oh yeah, totally. It was, uh, it was a different world. It, it was definitely a different world during Istanbul, you know? So yeah. we did a week there, but, um, great host. I mean, there, there's, you know, it was really, I was there just through hockey. I had a couple of days to kind of do the boat rides and stuff like that and see the city. But, um, besides that, that's kind of, that's where it ended. We did that, and we went to Luxembourg for two weeks. So, what do you think that is? You mentioned hockey IQ. So, I had a, I had an opportunity to play in Japan as well, and um, and I can totally relate to what you're saying there. Like, I thought the Japanese players on an individual level were were good players. They were fast, yeah. and they could shoot a puck, and you know they could play. But I felt in that environment, mm-hmm. like they didn't. They hadn't learned the game. I felt like the way that I had learned it. So you know, you know, some of the plays that you make that are just instinctive that maybe mm-hmm. you don't you don't necessarily know that the guy is there, but he should be there. Like I found myself at the beginning making plays like that, and and they weren't there. You know, like yeah. And, and uh, 
So do you mm-hmm. think that's like an upbringing thing, like the way the game's taught there, or because they seem to have the skill level? Like, how do you how do you make that more of a complete team or more of a complete player? I think over there, they just not there's not a lot of hockey players. Hockey's not really looked at as a sport, you know, I mean, a big sport there. So the the talent pool is pretty short um, and ice time. So um, for us, you know, we just grew up on the ice all day, you know, all day, all night type thing. So um, with the IQ part, back to what you're saying, that they all knew how to play the game or their skill level, but they just – the hockey reads weren't there. Um, I think it's more or less just doing a lot of reps, you know, small area games and, you know, yeah. that's kind of the, the path. But they're, they're passionate, though. They're watching hockey highlights and stuff like that. I was like, okay, right on, you know, so. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah well, let's go back to, to, to yeah. the start for you. Um, yeah. uh, I read a, I read a pretty powerful article that CBC was, was, was a part of, which I didn't know. Um, and just for, for, for those listening and we'll, we'll touch on Vernon, but I knew you from Vernon originally cause I'm from Vernon. Right. So then right, right, uh, yeah. we, we had that connection there not that we played against each other necessarily, but, mm-hmm. um, but you know, you were, you were a Vernon, a Vernon Laker and uh, coming yeah. from Toronto and had, and had a great season here. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you talk about growing up and, and when I mean growing mm-hmm. up, I mean like the roots, because a lot of times I have guys in the program and there's so many different routes, you know, like you've mentioned yeah. a little off camera and we were talking there for two minutes about your journey, you know, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, some yeah. guys journey or they're the star of the, they're the star of the team the whole way. And it's easy. And, you know, they're best in the area and, you know, the top round draft mm-hmm. pick and some guys have our average players on the minor league teams. And, you know, like, so mm-hmm. can you talk about yourself growing up at the part of the area that you grew up and what hockey, you know, what, what, what hockey was like for you at, from the minor hockey level? Yeah, well, um, I guess we can go all the way back to where, you know, raised by a single mom, you know, I was kind of uh, raised in the projects downtown Toronto. Uh, the, old, the I think it was the first uh, um, inner city, so to speak, uh, in, in Canada called Regent Park. So growing up single mom, um, every, all the kids played hockey a little bit, you know, outdoor ball hockey and stuff. And I really caught on a little bit early. My mom brought me out to play some hockey and um it started there at a rink called Moss Park. It was a free league. Um, got some equipment, went down there and played. Um, and then you kind of grow up in the inner city and, um, you know, it, it, it's expensive to play hockey, obviously. So I always played rec hockey growing up. Um, I never really could travel. Whenever I traveled, I'd have to go on my own. You know, I'd hop on the, uh, the transit where I'd take the bus on my own, put a hockey bag, rush hour with my stick and trying to move my way in on a streetcar subway. But I was getting hockey, um, so it started there. And then um, I fast forward a little bit. I'm I'm thirteen. I'm how, how old? How old are you? How old were you doing that? You're, you're taking. I was, you're taking train. I would have been ten years old, eight, nine, ten years old. That back then, that's just how you got around. You know, my mom would give me a quarter and hop on the subway and get get to my game somewhere. You know, my rec uh, my rec game. So I just loved hockey, Jay. It was. Um, if I can put you in uh, the inner city, you can imagine it's kind of like the movies, you know, it was, uh, back in the eighties, um, there was drugs everywhere, drug dealers, um, um, prostitution, just stuff that it, there was fights. It, it was, uh, I was living a movie and, but it was all right. That was my, that was my reality. Um, so I just played hockey all day. Whenever I could play hockey, that's, that's all I did because everything else, out, you know, outside of hockey was, wasn't be, wasn't fun to be around. Right. So um, I kept playing hockey um, in the group that we hung around with. One of my best friends, uh, Jeff Wilson, he kind of had a, a close knit family that really supported him. He had some money and he was always playing on the top teams, the travel teams, triple A teams. And deep down inside, I knew I was as good as him because we'd always play together. Right. But I was kind of raw. You know, I wasn't really coached. So he ends up um, he ends up finishing up in triple A midget. And I'm playing high school hockey in Canada and Toronto. You know, I'm playing uh, select hockey. I'm playing wherever I can without having to play. So high school hockey, you don't have to pay. Uh, selects, you may have to pay a little bit. But Jeff was really a AAA, played for the uh, the Red Wings with um, – or the Young Nats with Kevin Weeks, the goalie. I don't know if you're Weeksy at all. In, well, I played with him. You've been him. a guest on here too, Weeksy, yeah. Okay. Sure. So, yeah. so anyway, I knew Weeksy a little bit from Jeff and um, – so midget midget stunt triple a i'm playing high school hockey and jeff's one jeff's going to junior b hockey now you know for a scholarship route you know he doesn't go to the ohl or whatever and um he's a there's a new team in richmond hill richmond hill right they kind of just formed and jeff's the 
the kind of star player that's coming in. They're trying to recruit him. And Scott Mosley's the coach, and Jeff's like, hey, I got, I got a good friend of mine. He's, he's a good player. He, can you come try out? And I'm kind of nervous, and so I went and tried out with Jeff. Um, I was the last cut. Uh, I made that team last cut, and – if I didn't get a ride up there, I wasn't going. I wouldn't have been a play, I wouldn't have been able to play junior hockey. So um, I go up there, play a few years, get coached, learn how to play the game right, and um, a couple of good years. And then next thing you know, I'm in Vernon. You know, uh, I needed to get away from Toronto because I was I was 18, 19 now. All my good friends were starting to booze. They're giving up on hockey, but I was still focused. I really wanted to get. So I wanted to leave that area and get you know, make something of myself. Yeah, and. Um, and so, and I wasn't doing very good in high school. You know, the high school I was going to wasn't, um, you know, you, you had you had pregnant girls in the classes. The teachers didn't care if you went. Um, no one's holding you accountable. Like, what are you going to do to me, right? You're going to kick me out of school? Okay. You know, so it was one of those things. And um, I was like, I need to get out of here. And I went to a, a summer, uh, a camp in uh, Guelph called the Lakeland Super Camp. Uh, Rob Bremner, the head coach of Vernon Lakers were there. And um, I went out there and had a good camp. And he's like, hey, Metro, why don't why you, you come out here? You know, uh, Paul Korea is from out here. And all, I didn't know much about it, right? And I'm like, yeah, I need a change. So I'm making all these decisions on my own. I'm living with a single uncle at the time. He's out. Amazing guy supported me. But, you know, he was a single single dad just kind of working all the time. And I was just raising myself. So I made this decision. I'm like, I got to get out of here. And so it was the best decision of my life. Went to Kalamalka High School, uh, you know, graduated, um, had all the schools after me. I was having a good year. Flew down to Bowling Green, Ohio, um, signed a letter of intent with Buddy Powers. And I got a call in the summer. I stayed later on in Vernon to finish up my school. Yeah. I got a call and they said, uh, you know, Metro, the NCAA clearing house didn't, uh, you know, they, they want you to be redshirted. You have to sit out a year. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to do that. So I went the other route. I was like, okay, I don't have an agent. I guess I need one. But I called Troy Mick, who was the assistant coach at the time in Vernon. Right. Yeah. And he got me a trout in Nashville, uh, in the East Coast Hockey League. Why did you need a red shirt? What was the issue with that? Uh, my grades. My grades weren't good enough. My, my GPA average, my overall average. So I'd have to sit out a year, get those grades up. And I wasn't great in school anyway. It was one of those things that everyone's telling you, oh, yeah, go to school, go that route. And, you know, I didn't, it right. just didn't work out for me that way. And I just wanted to play hockey, you know, and um, gotcha. I made the decision there to call Troy and Troy got me a trout actually with the Atlanta Knights in the IHL. And I got sent down after a week and I was down in Nashville for three weeks before camp <laughs> and then healthy scratch, but we can go on to that too. You yeah, know? Yeah, so, yeah. Well, what about, so, so the whole Richmond Hill thing. So you played more than one year there, like for that, for yeah. that team? I played two years there. Yep. Two years. First year was kind of like I got I got my feet wet a little bit, kind of learned a little bit. I, I think I had a point a game, sixty points or something, sixty games. So I'm not told. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know if you have the, uh, elite prospects up or. Yeah. Um, but I played up uh, that one year, and then the second year really found my I really found my way and had a great year. And then um, then it was like I needed more of a challenge as well, and right. I didn't want to go back for a third year. Just I knew it wasn't for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you came to Vernon and led the led the Vipers or the Lakers. I think the Vipers now led the Lakers yeah. in scoring. And what, what, were you like one of the? Did you lead the league in scoring that year, or where were you with that? Um, I think I was like top five, I believe. Top five. I think I was top five. I'm I'm, I'm not I'm sure where I finished, but um, right. it was in just a great year. It was a culture too, shock, assume, right? Huh? That was the old Civic Arena too, right? At that yeah, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Place was great, man. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did that like j- just to touch on on your upbringing and and it's uh, mm-hmm. I mean one I'm curious because it's it's such a far I mean I grew up in Vernon right so you I mean you saw yeah, Vernon yeah. like that's that was my home you know single yeah, right, single right. Uh, only child you know mm-hmm. dad dad m- mom and dad in the house you know I was the only thing that they really needed to worry about or were concerned about so um, mm-hmm. yeah it definitely I mean had all the support in the world um, and that obviously has an effect on me, it had an effect on me as a young man, right? It, it, it changes your view of the world, your worldview, right? Mm-hmm. And then I know there's some things from my own upbringing that I'm trying to not do with my own kids, right? Like you learn some things, uh, yeah. you tweak some things, yeah. and you do some things. But how did like how did it for you affect you? Like, do you think it helped you as a hockey player in any aspect? 
I think for me, uh, Jay, it was more, it was survival for me, really. Um, that was my, that was just my, back to what I said, it was my happy place being on the ice. You know, my, my life outside the rink just wasn't, wasn't a happy place. And I'm not knocking my family down or anything like that. It just was, you know, they had issues and, um, you know, I was moving around a lot. I was in and out of foster homes for a little bit. You know, my mom couldn't, couldn't afford us and, you know, she had her issues and living with family members. So, um, it, it's all a little bit of a blur, Jay, as I think back about it, but I just remember that my creativity, my happiness was being on the ice. And when I was in school, I'd be just looking out the window, you know, thinking about hockey and couldn't wait to watch the Leafs play, even though they were terrible, but it was just like, I, I was just all hockey and, um, that, that's all I wanted to do. Um, so even like, so, so when I'm working with players now and, and generally the players, you know, that I'm working with, they're, you know, midget age or Bantam age or junior age. And, and, yeah. and, and I talk yeah. a lot about their environment, right? Their inner circle and, and, and who's around them. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's important regardless of where you are, right? Because even at that level yeah. of the junior level, and you've seen it at the pro level, right? Like there's some guys that are just wired different that go about their business different. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and if you, yeah. and if you, nurture those connections it makes you better uh it sounded like you did even though there was a you know a, a not an amazing environment in, in quite a few respects uh in mm -hmm. your in your home life like did you you seem to find a, a little bit of a circle there that was that was healthy yeah. for you? did you find yeah yeah the, the good thing about toronto is that we've had uh the boys and girls club the parks and recreation centers um and then see when you grew up in a neighborhood like where i grew up you had that you kind of had the bad kids that didn't like sports you know because sports save you right it teaches you a lot about life and then you got you had the guys that we all we did was just play hockey together play baseball you know we, we challenge each other in races around the rink or whatever you know what i mean just play playing games together so we had our group but the other group just got lost you know they just now they're you know they're doing stuff that mischief they're doing shit that they should be doing so um my mentors growing up was you know my my uncles watching hockey you know they're they there for me but really it was the after school programs at the parks and recreation centers those were the one those were the mentors those right. the people that worked at the boys and girls club that kind of told you to you know to, to keep fighting you know to do that extra squat you know i, I even boxed you know what i mean um i was boxing after school i just didn't want i just always wanted to do stuff yeah. so it's not be on um, the street right yeah yeah so um with that being said, yeah, I think uh, you know, we had a group of guys that were kind of focused on just playing sports, you know, and that's kind of who I gravitated towards. Yeah. And my brother, yeah, that's it. That's it. The uh, and like now there's such a, I mean, as you know, I mean, there's skill development coaches uh, on, at every level. I mean, even down to like Adam, some Adam teams are having skill coach. I mean, it, it's crazy, yeah. right? Like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. how how nuts the the game has shifted, and yet here you are, a 400 game NHLer. Uh, and didn't necessarily play any type of organized official hockey, essentially your entire youth, which it sounds mm -hmm. like, right? I played single A hockey for a few years, but when we're talking probably 13 to 15, you know, single right. A where, you know, twice a week you're, you're going to play games. It wasn't like you're practicing. <laughs> you're, the, you're the right winger. So you stay on that side of the ice. Right. Right. <laughs> that, that oh really. Gosh. That is so wild. I mean, yeah. and I just, I mean, I absolutely love that aspect. Maybe we should get into the pro scenario. I mean, I don't know if I should digress or focus on it, but like for some reason, obviously you were, you were a hell of a hockey player, right? I mean, there was something about you that you, you knew how to play the game. You understood the game. You were skilled enough uh, for you to, to have that development curve and then go to the junior ranks and to be as successful as you were there. It wasn't, I mean, you earned your your ability to get a tryout. You earned you earned your spot on the ECHL team. It wasn't like you were drafted and oh, we need to make this work out, right? Like you were you were yeah. able to do that, and not everyone is able to do that. So it's not like your story really applies to everyone, but it is quite it, it's inspiring to me, you know that that the success that you were able to have, and also the road that you took to get there. Um, yeah. Gratitude is a word that I've been using with my clients a lot lately, and it's sort of been on the top of my head. Uh, was there a lot of gratefulness for you just going through it, like being in Vernon, like seeing the lake there, being on this team in that league? And I mean, I don't know, yeah. like I, I, I would like to hear it from you, but I, I find gratitude to be such a healthy, high performance tool. And when guys have it, it's like I, I think it's something that makes people better. Did you carry gratitude with you a lot of the a lot of your way? 
Oh yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I was the kid. I always said thank you and to everybody. And, uh, I just love being at the rink. So I, I say that all the time, man. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful all the time. I'm grateful. I wake up in the morning. I still I write down what I'm grateful for. That's actually part of my, my days. Um, but I, I just had enthusiasm, you know, passion for the game. Um, I don't know if that's taught, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's, it's in your, it's not. Um, and I think I, I was in love with the game. I couldn't get enough of, of watching hockey too. You know, that, that was the thing too. I watched hockey. That's all I did. Even Toronto Maple Leafs, like back in the early nineties, late eighties, they weren't very good. So, but I just, I love the game so much, you know, the sticker books, uh, anything I could do with hockey. I was in the library trying to le- learn how to do a wrist shot. You know, and they didn't have any illustrations. I was just anything I could do. You know, I was just trying to find stuff on hockey. You know, and um, but yeah, great uh, gratitude, grateful. I mean, yeah, I've, I've always, I always was. You know, I think so. I had um, I have a a, a family friend who's also a, a client, and he 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 was a top prospect. He even drafted third round in WHL and and played as a, as a, as a young WHLer four years now. Got but passed over in the NHL draft twice, you know, for whatever reason, right? Like good player. <laughs> I mean, hasn't really you know peaked, I guess, or hadn't really got noticed. And then he just got invited to the Edmonton Oilers uh, prospects camp. So like he leaves today. Nice. And, and okay. when he called me, when he got the call from Edmonton, I had honestly never I had never heard. It, gratitude from a human being like that and it wasn't gratitude to me i don't mean that i mean grateful for the opportunity from the edmonton oilers right like yeah yeah. he was so excited and so thankful and so grateful and it just like yeah it's just it's such a special feeling like it and because i remember on the flip side of it like be, me being supposed to be in the first rounder, like I'm just talking about the draft now, and then like these all these crazy things happen on draft day and slide to 31, and I was pouty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like I was pouty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it, yeah, it was, yeah. And I'm being yeah. completely transparent. Like yeah, it was a yeah. bad day for me, right? Being 31st overall in the world, yeah. you know, like yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and then like if you don't make the NHL team, going to the minors, you're kind of pouty because you're like, oh, I'm yeah, I shouldn't yeah. be here, and like. But um, but gratitude, yeah. like there's so many times and there's so there's so many options to be grateful, right? Um, mm. And obviously, you know, I, I just I just find that so compelling. Like w- w- from your story and your background, that prop, I mean, getting that, getting having that opportunity to be a pro in the ECHL, I'm sure you weren't too bitchy about not making the IHL. You're probably this is pretty good. I got a paycheck, have a chance to play, right? Like I was making I was making 425 bucks a week, right? I mean. I, I got sent down to Nashville and I was a healthy scratch for the first 10 games. I remember uh, I got on our first bus ride down to Tallahassee to play against the Tiger Sharks. And uh, we had a full squad, pretty solid older guys, Dixon Ward, a um, uh, b- bunch of a uh, bunch of other veteran guys. Right. And I was, I was the guy that I was sleeping at the front with the, our, our bus driver's nickname was snake. He was wearing a scorpions leather jacket, cut off sleeves. No joke, I'm not lying, but I was lying on the stairs as you know the Greyhound bus as you can get off. I was sleeping on those stairs, and I healthy scratch. But no, what I was back to your word, grateful. I was I was playing pro hockey, and um, you know I wasn't giving up. So that was right. you know part of the journey back to back to the journey uh, word. Just want to take a short break from the podcast to. Talk about all things up my hockey. Uh, as you may or may not know, I have never accepted um, an official sponsorship from anyone for this podcast. This podcast wasn't meant to generate income. That was not uh, the genesis for it. It was more or less to have discussions about hockey that provide value to the hockey community, to hockey players and to hockey parents and to hockey coaches about you know what it takes to get there, what it takes to make it. And it allows me to have conversations on topics that are near and dear to me and to what I do now with Up My Hockey, which is mentor young players in the mental aspects of the game, to allow them to play their best hockey, to allow them to make their de- their dreams and their goals come true. Uh, super rewarding uh, stuff that, that I'm doing and and I'm super thankful for, for all the players and all the parents that I've had the opportunity to work with and support. Now, the services and the products of Up My Hockey is what really 
supports this podcast because without without the players and the parents who are willing to invest in the peak potential program or the teams that are willing to uh, invest in the peak potential program or, or the players that are working with me either privately or through the group calls, there would be no way that this podcast could exist. So I thank you for all you people who have supported up my hockey and for all the players that I have been able to work with and the teams that I've been able to support. Uh, it really allows this podcast to happen. So for you, if you are interested in supporting the podcast, uh, I have mentioned this before. You can do that either by sharing the podcast, by allowing this message to get out to more players and to more parents and to more coaches, uh, either on your social media or in your uh, inner social circles uh, by word of mouth. That would be much appreciated. And, uh, and also, obviously, by using um, the Peak Potential product. If you have a hockey player that you would like to have more confidence, to gain resiliency, to grow leadership skills and personal accountability and uh, commitment to their game, uh, have the growth mindset required to really flourish, the Peak Potential Hockey Project is for you. Uh, it's honestly a no-brainer as a dad. Uh, I, I'm having a much easier time promoting and marketing the course because I've seen the success of it countless times, again and again and again. The testimonials speak for themselves. And as a father of young hockey players, I know the value of what this stuff teaches uh, in the terms of what it provides to young men and women who are going to be adults uh, roaming around this this earth, whether they're going to be playing hockey or not. These are these are also life skills. So, uh, yes, if you have a hockey player, if you have somebody that is driven and, and has is passionate about the sport and wants to go places, the concepts talked about in the Peak Potential Hockey Project, the way they are laid out, the assignments provided, the coaching calls that come with it are making a big impact are the players that are that are taking it. So check out the next, uh, the next guided mission of the Peak Potential Hockey Project. That's where you get to work with me uh, on four different coaching calls uh, in a group environment after each week of, um, of, the, th- of the theming. And, uh, and I offer that about every five weeks. So we have, it's a four-week program. We usually take a week off, and then I have another guided, guided mission. There's also a solo mission for those of you who just want to purchase it for your player uh, and go through it together, potentially, uh, father-son, father-daughter, mother-son, mother-daughter, however it may work. Uh, there's a solo mission, or just the player by themselves can, can also take that without any coaching or reinforcement. And there also is the mentored mission. So that's when your player would work directly with me throughout the entire four weeks, private coaching calls, a very, very personalized tour of, of the concepts within. Um, so that's the three ways to take it as an individual. And if you want to take this as a team, I've talked about this before on the show, uh, the team building of of what the Peak Potential Hockey Project does uh, for these teams that take it, it, it it's, it's really fantastic. It gives the team a foundation, a cultural uh, foundation to build from. Uh, the players all are given the tools to understand what growth mindset is, what what it means to make mistakes, what it means to have personal deliberate practice, how to become more accountable to their game and to their development and to each other, uh, to become better teammates, uh, better leaders within the dressing room. Uh, it really provides an an absolutely terrific foundation to uh, to start a season from or to have a mid season. Um, boost from or to get ready for the playoffs. So if you are a coach or a manager or a parent of somebody on a team, a, a competitive team that wants to have that little extra competitive edge this year, that's another way uh, to support this show. So everything can be found on upmyhockey.com. That's the website, uh, and that is where the services are provided. I'm really going all in the Peak Potential Project. It's uh, It's been fantastic to work with these players, whether individually or on teams, and that is how you can support this show. So Thanks again for everyone who has participated. Thanks again for listening. And let's get back to the show with Glenn Metropolit. At, at, at what point was was NHL on your radar? Like, was that something that, I mean, you said you watched it. You said you were in love with it. Was that something that you thought you could be doing at some point? Um, I, I first realized that when Harry York Harry York played in Nashville. I don't know if you remember that name, Harry York, but he was mm-hmm. he was in, he played in SJ uh, Yorkton, I think York in a uh, Saskatchewan Junior uh, Hockey League. And was he a Ranger he, at one point? What? Yeah, yeah, he was a Ranger at one point. Yeah. yeah, but he ended up getting called up to Worcester from the East Coast, and then he got his chance up in St. Louis, and he was doing well. And I'm like, fuck, excuse my language. Harry, you know, Harry's up there. I'm like, okay, I think I can do it. 
and that kind of just you know get my confidence going he's there and you know i was competing against him in the east coast hockey league on the same team and we we're buddies roommates and then uh, from there i just kind of I, I i started believing a little bit more in myself you know but right. initially jay i just wanted to play pro hockey you know right. i wanted to i wanted to postpone going back to toronto as long as i could right because it wasn't a healthy environment back there when that when that when that belief switch flipped for you did that um did that change any of your habits, any of your routines, any of your attention to detail with practice or anything? Or like what, 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 how did that influence your, you and your career? Do you think? Um, I, I think at the time, um, I think it was more, he was riding a bike at night and stuff like that. And I wasn't doing that stuff. And then I, I started doing what he did. And then it was, I, I really became more invested, you know, and I was the last guy off the ice, but I, I always, I always was, was kind of like the last guy off, but I, I realized that, you had to put more work into it. You just couldn't be happy where you were. Right. You know? Um, and then, you know, it's, then you're in survival mode too. At right? summertime comes around, you know, after East Coast Hockey League day, uh, East, my first year. And I'm like, okay, I had a little bit of money saved. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be able to hit the gym. You know, let's work on my legs, do my, my program that I had from Bowling Green. I was just going to do that program for the summer. Yeah. And I started that, but I didn't have enough money. So I was like, I was starting to do some, um, landscaping work and during the season I ended, there was a rhi the roller hockey international and they ended up drafting me they took all the minor league guys and had a draft and it was a pretty big league back at the time good good summer job for the minor league hockey guys you know yeah. to make some money in the summer so i was laying down sod and you know cutting bushes and i'm like man i don't want to do this so i ended up going to i played in a roller hockey league that summer in a professional roller hockey league with uh, the Long Island Jaws and trying to work out and playing roller hockey. And that's what I did for that summer, you know? And then, um, then after that summer went, went by, I ended up going to, um, ended up going to Pensacola, the ice pilots at the time, East coast hockey league. Yeah. And they were, in a, they were affiliated with the IHL team in Quebec, Quebec Raphaels. So I went to Quebec, started off pretty good, but then ultimately I got sent down to Pensacola. And uh, there, there again, had a great year, put up some great numbers, made it to the conference finals, I think. So you and made then, that team out of camp? Like you made an IHL team on a, as, as yeah. a, I mean, what would that be called? A free, I mean, you didn't have an NHL deal, so it was just a pro, pro contract, yeah. IHL pro contract. Yeah, IHL pro contract, yeah. So I ended yeah. up getting a two-way contract, right? Pro and Pensacola. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was up and down a little bit throughout the year, Pensacola, Quebec. And then finished off in Pensacola. Uh, we had a great run. I think we lost in the conference finals. Um, and then now I'm on top. Like, I feel really good. You know, I had such a great year. A lot of confidence now. Um, again, I go I go into the summertime, wanting to just train, work out in Toronto. Um, it wasn't the right time for me to be in Toronto, just working out, seeing my friends and all that. So back to roller hockey. With uh, Team Canada, won a world championship with Team Canada and Anaheim. Okay, can we? And then, I want to back up on though, if you if if you yeah. don't mind, just so like you go back, so you're a pro. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe do you mind sharing what you're making in the EC in the? Well, you said 400 a week. Is that essentially what you were making there that second year too, roughly? Uh, I think I was making around 750 a week. 750 a but, week. So yeah, so I mean, you're not. Yeah, I'm, you're, not, you're, I'm, not, banking. Yeah. I'm not banking. I'm not banking. You're not banking. At this point, you're probably what 22, 23. I, I think if um, I got my, I'm 22, 22, 22. Yeah, go yeah. back to Toronto and home for Toronto still is is that Regent Park area. Is that where you would go back to? Yeah, it'd be the East End Regent Park. Yeah. Um, now all my buddies are now they're more into the bar scene, you know, and I'm I'm kind of getting caught into it a little bit with them. And then finally, I was like, okay, I gotta I'm living with my single uncle. You know, it became a little bit of a a happy house. You know what I mean? And I was just like, okay, I, I knew it was more of a gut thing again. I'm like, I got to get out of here. Right. And and so I went to, I played with Team Canada in the, the World Championships out in Anaheim and ended up winning there. Um, I signed a contract while I was out there with Grand Rapids Griffins. So I ended up winning a gold medal. I ended up playing with the Anaheim Bullfrogs, win the championship with them as well. And then I ended up going to, uh, I finally got my one way deal in Grand Rapids with Dave Allison as a coach. Right. And um, so here I am at camp, can't skate, pucks are heavy. You know what I mean? Because roller hockey, right? You're, the blades were different, the pucks were lighter. Um, but um, 
I go to camp, not very good camp, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, I, I'm there with my, my girlfriend at the time. She moves in with me. We're up there in Grand Rapids and camp wasn't great. I get sent down to Muskegon. The team goes to Orlando, the IHL team, Grand Rapids. They go to Orlando. Dave Allison's like, hey, you're going to go down to Muskegon. And um, what you leaks at? U Haul, United Hockey League. And I get down there. I go see the coach. He's in this like little room, smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? I'm, I'm here for a few days while the team's gone to Orlando. I was like, yeah, okay, well, um, you can get a jersey. And they give me a jersey, like a football jersey. My gut's showing. I'm on the ice. <laughs> my my line mate's like Gary Gupal. This guy got suspended by every every league. He's my line mate. And that was, that was a big wake-up call where I was so down on myself where I was just like, man, this – there's no way am I going to be down here. I wasn't playing down there because I was on a contract with Grand Rapids. I was just down there kind of training, skating, whatever. Yeah. And that was a big wake-up call for me. And then I ended up, uh, I ended up getting back up and, um, you know, Dave Allison started to kind of hop on my, you know, he kind of gave me some more responsibility. I was playing with Mark Gregg and um, Michelle Picard, two great vets. They mm-hmm. took me under their wing and um, – I started cruising, you know I mean? Not cruising, but I started getting confidence in playing. Right. Yeah. But man, where did the compass come from? Uh, you know, like to at 22 to say, Hey, this, you know, cause that's, it's, it's an easy, it's an easy one to fall into. And especially you, you mean yeah. you going back there, you're probably, I don't know what the right way to put it, but I mean, you're the pro hockey guy that comes back in the summer, you, you, you know, yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah. for your buddies and, and you're, you're probably a rock star. Like to, to have, to yeah. have that, like yeah, well, there's a fork in the road. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 you know what I mean. Yeah, there's a yeah. fork. Well, what what made you what made you leave? Like, what do you think it was? I, I just knew that wasn't for me. Uh, you know, I went back there, back to Toronto, back to your point. Um, my my buddies, they you know the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, partying. You know, what I mean, I, I was trying to train, trying to work out, and that was that was my core friends. You know, what I mean, doing that. So it was like, okay, I'm doing it with them, and then I was like, no, this is not this is not who I am, and. It, it was a it was a gut check and it was like okay I got to get out of here again you know what I mean I got to take care of Glenn so yeah. um, and that yeah. that's kind of you know but I think I, I learned that as growing up you know I was in and out of different homes and I was okay moving you know getting out of my comfort zone right so right. Um, so yeah. you're at Grand Rapids so then you go to Grand Rapids you got your one way and maybe you saying a one way you're saying a one way AHL one way right a pro yeah so. IHL oh, IHL yeah. 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 And uh, and you and you catch fire. I mean, a point a game there, eighty-one points in seventy-seven games. That's mm-hmm. uh, th- that's a hell of a year. I mean, that's a hell of a year. What? Uh, yeah. And you're one step away from the NHL now, right? So you said earlier, like you, you know, you believed because you saw you saw um, Yorkie go up there and do it, right? And you're like, all right, yeah. all right, maybe this is for me. But now you're actually performing and doing it at uh, you know the second best mm-hmm. league in the world, really, by, by some accounts. Mm-hmm. And and so was. Was that fire even even a little brighter? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that, that was my goal now, right? I was kind of, I knew I was kind of sniffing a little bit, and yeah, I mean, learning from the other guys. You know, uh, Michelle Picard. I, I thought he was the best player I ever played with. This guy was so good, and he was up and down with St. Louis Blues too. And he'd get called up and he'd score, and I'd be like, "Wow, man, I love this guy." And I, I just kept grinding. <laughs> I just kept on, you know, riding a bike, getting in the gym after, and just, you know, being the last guy off the ice. Right. That was that was part of the routine. So what happened with it? So end of that season, um, did yeah. you have a one year deal? Because then, like, you're up in like next year is your is your is your mm-hmm. first dance in, in the show, right? So how does how does that all happen? How does it is it contract based or 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 what happened? Is this with the caps? Yeah, the caps. Yeah. Um, I ended up hiring uh, Billy Zito as my coach, or as my agent, Bill Zito. Um, I met him. Who was he? I think he was Michelle Picard's agent. So Pick, Pick said, yeah, why don't you hop on with Bill? He, he likes you. And, and he he ended up taking me to the draft that was in Boston, and I met up with a few teams. And um, we ultimately – decided on Washington because they lost in the finals that year to the Red Wings. They lost like four straight or four one. And some guys were leaving and were like, okay, this might be a good opportunity. You know, they might, they might be rebuilding. I was 24, 25. And uh, we ended up signing a contract there with the, 
you know, George McPhee and the Caps. Rob Wilson was the coach. Tim Army was the assistant coach. And Tim Hunter. Right. And uh, I made I made the team out of camp. You know, I was on top of the world. Yeah, man, I made the team out of camp. Uh, starting lineup in um, it with the floor against the Florida Panthers. I'm lined up against Pavel Burry. So I'm with Adam Oates and Peter Bondra. So I'm like, I'm telling myself too, Jay. I'm like, play your game. Don't worry about it. Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the greatest game. I played 18 minutes dash one, but I just, I didn't want to make a mistake. I played scared and, you know, and um, after the game, I got sent down in another low point. You know what I mean? What? Absolutely crushed me. They sent after me down after that one? game. After game one. Yeah. I got sent down and, um, here I am down in Portland, you know, it's a uh, gloomy down there. And I'm like, I'm mad at the world, right? I'm like, oh, man, I, I didn't think I was, I was ever going to get called back up. So I had a good, good week of feeling sorry for myself. It was like, okay, don't worry about it. Metro. Okay, let's get on it. Yeah. Get back on a train here and get working. You know, Glenn Hanlon was a great coach for me. Um, you know, it, it did nothing for me going down there. Pouting. You know what I mean? I was in my own head, my own world. And, Sure enough, I went down there after a good week and just started battling. I was fighting. You know, I was doing whatever I can. Glenn was a great coach for me. And then I was getting up, called up and down, and I ended up playing with Chris Simon and uh, Adam Oates. And I was having a good good year on it. But I was still a little bit raw for NHL. I wasn't, I wasn't ready as I think back. You know, it was a big – it was a heavy puck game. You know, chip it out. You'll hook in. And I just – I was good on a power play. I had some good skill, good mitts, you know, goal line fake pack to OC up the gauntlet bomb, you know, whatever. But, um, I just, I, I wasn't ready. I was still green. So let's talk, let's talk Like that, that's nuts to me. So you, you go from not drafted, not on any NHL radar to signing with, uh, I assume a two way with Washington. Is that what your contract yep, was? Yeah. Yep, 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 and yep. you make that team out of camp. Like what did you, I'm sure you had to surprise some people. Like even though you had such great numbers, like in Grand Rapids, I doubt they had you penciled in that starting lineup, right? Like, so did, did you? Did you have a pretty awesome camp? I had a good camp. I, I went in there feeling good, strong. I, was, I really had a good camp. I, mean, I felt good about my game. Too? Was it? Was yeah, good summer. Good? Yeah, yeah. I was able to just train out hard. You know, I, actually, I didn't go back to Toronto after that. That's I was with my girlfriend at the time in Pensacola. So I stayed there and I was really able to grind in the gym and do all my, my workouts on the beach and really focus, right. eat well. And um, I went in there focused and it was my, my time in my mind. You know what I mean? I'm going to show everyone, you know, and had a great camp. And, uh, you know, I made the team around Wilson. He told me the night before or whatever. And, um, yeah, but you know, then after so the first game. Yeah, so how does that, yeah. I mean, I've been in that chair, right? But not in that scenario. Yeah. I, I never had the luxury of, of making a team out of camp. I was like, you know, the last cut twice, you know, and like, then I was yeah. a call up and I, I never got told to go find a place, you know, like I was mm, always yeah, up yeah. down guys. So yeah. making it out of camp, I just never even heard of guys getting sent down after one game. Like, what was that conversation? Like, do you remember it in, in the office? What did they say? I don't remember Ron telling me, but I think it was more, uh, more or less um, George McPhee. I can't remember because it's such a blur. I was up and down so much, Jake. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. I but, totally get but it. I just remember be, being on the line, you know, after after camp and we had team practice as our lines and just being, wow, don't get caught up in it. You know what I mean? I, I just I just try to not get caught up in it, you know, but yeah, it's just it's a natural thing. There's no way around it. You know, I couldn't sleep. I was like, man, yeah, you know, I've. I've reached my dream. And well, the, the part that blows me away, and now you're on the coaching side of it, is like, okay, so so you have this guy that's impressed you enough out of camp. You know, at 24, 25, this is he's never played in the NHL before, mm-hmm. and he has like it couldn't have been a catastrophic game, but like a, a, a not a great yeah. game, and 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 the best <laughs> idea from the brass is we're going to send them down. That's just wild to me that that was like the yeah. like choice. Yeah. And, I know. Yeah. and how does that, I mean, and, and for the players listening, because there are a lot of players and like mm-hmm. listening that there are these down moments and there are these holes, right? And there are these times where you're feeling sorry for yourself and why me? And, and you know, it's very easy to play the victim role. Um, yeah, 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 you yeah, can yeah, all yeah. be pretty good at it. Uh, and in, for your scenario, wow, that's one of the ones where you could really feel like that's a gut punch. You said you gave yourself a good week there. What was, what was your... What was the the motiv- motivation to to get out of it, or what was you know? Do you remember what what that was to say? Hey, this is where I am. This is where I got to get. This is where I got to go. 
Yeah, I think they're just, uh, I realized after a little bit of time, feeling bad for myself or sorry for myself that, hey, man, at the end of the day, it's, it's up to you, right? You got you got to show them. So I got over that and it was like, either you you use it or it uses you. So I let it use me for a little bit. And I'm like, no, what? I'm going to use this as fuel. And I'm going to go shove it. You know what I mean? I'm going to go, I'm going to show them that I belong there. And um, the coach, the coach was a really good coach for me too. Glenn Hanlon, who was a really, um, he was so instrumental in being able to be a personable coach to me. You know what I mean? Like, right. I don't want to say the hugging type, but more like being, being eye to eye and be like, Hey man, this is not going to get you there unless you kind of wake up and put, you know, let's go. So, yeah. um, I was more of a guy that, that needed hugs, you know, not, not kicks in the ass type this, you know? So, um, that was great. And then I, I, you know, I was like, yeah, back, back to the point, use it or it uses you. So that's a great line. Yeah. That's a really good line because yeah, I mean, because yeah. again, there's, when I'm working with these players, like I'm always talking about decisions, right? That that we're faced <laughs> with so many decisions, right? And like how one yeah, event, yeah. like that one event for you of getting sent down, like f- for a handful, that would have ended it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Players, yeah. That, right. That's and it, for yeah, some yeah. others, it's going to be a different. It's going to mean something different to them, right? Like we get to choose the mm-hmm. meaning a lot of times, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Right. What does this mean to me? And for me, and and if we can align that with our goal of like for you now at this point, you've had that cup of coffee, you know what it tastes like, you've seen it, uh, mm-hmm. you believe it. You know, what I mean, you pouting in the minors isn't aligned with your goal of being an NHL, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not so feeling you sorry for you. Line. What's that? <laughs> they're they're not feeling sorry for you. you know, right. It's like, you know, you. And back in the day too, there wasn't a lot of communication, right? So even when I was getting called up, you're playing two, three minutes. You don't know why you're not playing more than. Two, you're just be pro, yep. play the game right, you know. So, yep. no, for sure. Uh, mm. And that's where I remember playing against you. I don't think we played against each other much, if at all, in, in the NHL. Yeah. But I remember you being in Portland, and and uh, yeah, and Were I you was, in Lowell. I think I was in Lowell at the time. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I think I was in Lowell at the time, and uh, mm. and yeah, you guys sure. had some good teams there, and you had you had one of my old line mates there with you, Trent Whitfield, at the time. I don't even remember. <laughs> Remember Witter very much, but we played Fuck. together in Spokane. So yeah, uh, love the kid, love the yeah. He went on to a good little career himself there for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, he put some miles on the body. Yeah. yeah, did he ever? Did he ever? What yeah. um, what so you so you ended up like so uh, Washington ended up being where you kind of you know cut your teeth a little bit right at, at the NHL, but that was also when you decided to to leave right like after your experience with them like can can you walk us through what what that was that was all about yeah when decided to, to hit the road yeah um i i, I felt uh you know I, I ended up signing with them again after that first year uh re-signed for two years i believe wait was it a two and two i, I forget jay but anyway my, my daughter was born olivia um in 2002 and so I'm up and down, getting sent up and down. And then next thing you know, I, I'm like, I can't do this no more. George McPhee, right? I was like, either you, get, you guys, I was, when I was getting sent down, I was fighting, scoring. I was doing whatever I could. And I was like, can you guys trade me? I asked for a trade. They're like, only if we can get something good, you know, assets, the right assets back. So nothing worked out. Um, so I'm like, Bill, how do I get out of here? You know, Bill Zito, you know, and he's like, well, they're not going to trade you. The only way you can go is you got to go to Europe. And then after one year in Europe, you're a free agent. So I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I know I'm good enough for the NHL, you know? And during this time too, it's like year three, I get in there and they give my number to Robert Lang without even telling me, you know, ask, not, not saying that got to ask me, but it was just like a whole, I, I was nothing in them. You know what I mean? That kind of really, that really kind of was part of it too. And um, Bruce Cassidy ended up getting a job um, over Glenn Hanlon. That was a turning point for me. Bruce Cassidy brought in, some of his uh, older vet players that co- you know he coached, Kip Miller, yeah. Yarmie Yeager came in, and um, I led the I led the preseason in scoring. So I'm like, okay, man, I, I still even though I know Cassidy didn't like me, I'm still gonna prove them wrong. You know, what I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna win a spot. Yeah. And um, long story short, I'm getting bag skated and all that, and then the year goes on, and I'm like, okay, I gotta get out of here, Bill. They didn't trade me, and so we had a few options. You know, I can go to Switzerland um russia I had some options i'm like no what up and he had good connections in finland he had a lot of players in finland at the time and uh he's like well why don't you go to helsinki have a great year you know and let's see what happens and that's kind of uh 
that's where it went from there. You know, I went there for a year, had a great year. Um, and then the lockout year came, Timmy Thomas was in net for us, the lockout year. Um, and that's where my confidence grew again. Saku Koivu was back in the league. Some other guys were playing. John Madden was playing in the SN Liga. Mm-hmm. And um, the rules changed. So now the game opened up a little bit. That was after the the, the lockout. So the, the rules changed. Now everyone, Danny Breer was on fire and all the smaller players were kind of really starting to, you know, it was kind of their game now, right? It wasn't a heavy puck game anymore. Yeah. And so uh, nothing went down after that year for some reason. I ended up signing with uh, Lugano in the Swiss National League. I go there one year, MVP of the league. We won a championship. I go to world championships. And um, I, I end up changing agents. I go with uh, Larry Kelly. And Larry Kelly calls me. He's like, hey, uh, that Atlanta Thrasher is really, they like you, Don Waddell. And I'm like, oh, great, you know. So that gave me a little boost during the playoffs in Lugano and I ended up going to uh, Team Canada and in, um, in Riga, and then uh, I ended up meeting um, Don Waddell, and then end up getting a deal with uh, Atlanta Thrashers. And I, I went to Europe though, man, with the whole I'm getting back, I'm proving everybody wrong. You know, I'm I'm the underdog. I'm I'm, I'm going. I'm going to prove everybody wrong, and that's when I had my best my best years. Right when I came back. Well, yeah, I, mean, I just know? looked it up. You're 32, coming back to the NHL. Yeah. Right for the majority of your career, then at that point too. I mean, that's where you played a lion's share of your games, right from thirty-two on. Yeah, um, yeah. So talk about earning it. Like that's fantastic. You know. Yeah. And, I mean, very similar. I mean, I had Derek Ryan on here, um, mm. geez, like a, a year and a half ago or whatever, and and you know, not that he played in the minors, but I mean, he he couldn't get a job anywhere except for like a second league team, I think, in Belarus or somewhere. I can't remember mm. exactly, but. Yeah, you yeah. know he owned that league, and he owned the next league that he went to, and then he was MVP in Switzerland. I mean, in uh, in uh, yeah. Sweden, right? And then he ended up coming back, and uh, mm-hmm. that's one thing I say to, to to players, right? Like when they're not happy with either the league that they're on or the line that they're on or whatever the case may be, I just say, own where you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know what I mean, right? Like if you're yeah, too good yeah. to be there, if you're too good to be on that line, then be too good to be on that yeah. line or to be in that league, you know, and mm-hmm. yeah, that's yeah, essentially yeah. what you did, right? I mean, you go to F- Finland, you're a top 10 score. You go to Finland again, top 10 score. You go to the Swiss league, you're a top score, right? Like yeah. Keep yeah. doing that again and again, like someone's going to notice they have to. Yeah. 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 I agree. Um, yeah. Just take it back. Yeah. Quite a, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then so Atlanta was, who, was uh, Lars on that team? Oh. Yeah. Lars. Yeah. Lars. Awesome, man. Love Lars. He, he was, so he was there. So, okay, so that was interesting. Maybe that's something that we can chat about because I'm sure I didn't check the other teams that you played for, but I'm sure there was a different culture in some of these places you were at. And, like, so Brad came to Atlanta after being with the Avalanche, right? And so he's been a guest on the podcast. And he was, a, yep. you know, it, it's something that I know is in his DNA now, his experience there with Colorado. Just, like, how good that team was and how they held each other accountable and, and like, what – you know, what mi- winning meant and what, and what it really took to win, right? Like he, he mm-hmm. saw it from a fourth line role and, and what the stars did and what their commitment level was. And then he said he got, he went to Atlanta and it was great for his career on a personal level, mm-hmm. but he's like, mm-hmm. it was night and day different. Oh, yeah. There, yeah, know, there was no like, culture there. There was no, yeah. He's like from a, from a, like you're in the same league, but you feel like you're in a different universe, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 What was your experience like from what you experienced in Washington to Atlanta? Was it similar? Like, was it, was it, was it quite a bit different or, or was, you know, I don't know, speak to that a little bit. And then maybe what, it, what your experience was like with some of these other teams that you got to that maybe had a little different vibe to it. Yeah. I, th- I think Washington, you know, they're established older team, you know, a little bit, uh, they had a good fan base, Washington capitals. Um, they had, they had a culture there a little bit, you know, they had Adam Oates guys in the dressing room, but then fast forward to Atlanta, it was just, you know, tra- um, transient town. You know what I mean? There wasn't no, it was so green, you know, basketball, football, Southern belt, you know, college football. Um, it just, uh, the, the, the vibe, the feeling wasn't there. And for me being coached by Bob Hartley, uh, if you're a bottom six guy and he doesn't like you, I don't want to say he didn't like me, but it was, it was a tough year on me coming back. I think I was 31, if I remember correctly. But anyway, coming back older guy, the year I had, 
Um, it was a tough year with Bob, and then I ended up getting traded at the deadline for Keith Kachuk in like, you know, half of, uh, you know, 10 picks. <laughs> I don't know how many, you know, so um, I ended up going to St. Louis, and that that was a, that year was a tough year because St. Louis, they're, they're, uh, I remember getting there in the, uh, the trade the day before trade deadline and everyone's kind of, they're on the outside looking. Everyone's thinking of, they're getting traded. Jamal Myers and uh, Dougie Wade, Billy Garen. And you didn't feel like you're going to be a part of a team. Even when I got traded there, you know, I went there with Brad boys and uh, Billy Niminen. And so I ended up finishing off uh, 20 games there. And now the summer comes, you know what I mean? It's like, what, what, where's, what's my leverage? You know, I'm 32 now. 31 and I'm like Larry what, what am I going to do what's happening you know and um Boston Bruins were, was interested and um I went there on the PTO like a professional tryout and I'm sitting in the boiler room during during leading into camp I get there a day before and I'm, I want to get on the ice get my gear going they have me down in the boiler not the boiler room but I wasn't in the main room so here I am you know I'm down with uh, the American Hockey League guys East Coast League hockey guys and that's okay but that's – I was going to Boston to make that team. And I knew Claude Julien a little bit from the World Championships with Team Canada. Yep. He was the head coach. And he kind of knew what I could do. He saw me and he knew my personality. And um, ended up making that team. And what a great year I had there too, man. Yep. I had a good role. I finally felt like I was an NHL player there. Bergeron went down with a concussion. He was out for the year. So our depth at center really went down. You know, we had – uh, David Kretschy, he was a rookie. Savard, uh, PJ Axelson, um, myself. I'm forgetting some other. Oh, uh, Sp- Sabolka. Vladimir Sabolka. So, kind of like we, we're pretty thin up the middle, you know, without Bergie. And um, I ended up taking his minutes, and here I am, you know, third line. I was playing with Lucic and uh, Chucky Kobusu. You know, Chucky we, Kobusu. Yeah, we had a. We had a solid year, you know, third line, chip it in, you know, Luch go run, and I, I could kind of make some plays, and Chucky was the sniper. So we, we had a good year. Just take another short break from the podcast and their conversation with Glenn Metropolit to talk about ways you can include my services and my concepts either in your association or for your team. Uh, I do offer workshops for coaches on culture. I've worked with associations in the past on how to build culture and how to build culture within your teams. Uh, That is a a product and service that I provide. And I also offer mindset masterclasses. So if you are an association head um, of either, you know, an academy or a minor hockey association and you'd like to get some information on mental toughness, resiliency, mindset uh, to your to your membership base, I do provide um, either Zoom or in person uh, master classes on mindset. Uh, this has been a great opportunity for me to get out the concepts, uh, to share the concepts with others, and it is inspiring to those who are in attendance uh, to move forward and to and to include mindset as part of their training, and, and to know how to include mindset as part of their training and part of their development. So two options there that some people are unaware of as far as uh, being on stage or being on a, on a Zoom video call that we can uh, discuss culture with coaches or with parents and also a mindset masterclass. So if you're interested in either one of those, by all means, you can reach out at upmyhockey.com. Uh, there is a, a, a submission box there, a contact form, or you can reach out directly at Jason uh, to Jason at upmyhockey.com. That's my personal email if you'd like to get in touch with me and, uh, and discuss what that might look like for your association team or, uh, or academy pro- program. So thanks a lot for listening. We'll get back to the podcast with Glenn Metropolit. Yeah, I'm, I'm an older guy. They didn't want to bring me in as a third line centerman because Bergeron's coming back now. You got Kretschy, you got you know Swabolka, you got Savvy. And, How did you navigate um, that Metro? Like so, being and, and that's another thing that a lot of a lot of the guys that I'm that I'm with have a hard time dealing with when they level up, right? And I know that we've both experienced it. But you're you know you're you're a point leader in the into not let alone on your team that you're playing on, but sometimes in the league that you're in, and then the next place you go you're not getting those same minutes, right? And you're not in yeah, those yeah. same scenarios. So how did you adapt to that? Like, did you did you have to change your game? Did you have to fall in love with different aspects of the game to be relevant? Or, or like, what was your approach to that? 
Um, I, I knew whatever role I had to, whatever role they were giving me, I had to do the best I could in my ability. So some t- I was a penalty killer in uh, Boston. So now I had, to, I had to become a penalty killer. So it was all about angles and trying to be the best penalty killer. And that's, and I was always a good teammate, I think too, Jay. So I think that goes around where, you know, I was, I was a grocery stick in the middle, sometimes right in the middle of the D and the forwards. And I was rah, rah, you know, it's let's go boys. So it was just uh, being a good team guy and whatever they needed from me. Yeah. You know, I tried my best to, to provide the best I could. And it wasn't about, uh, I didn't have no ego. It was whatever the team needed. And, um, you just got to realize that. And I think I learned that as a younger age, trying to get up at different levels, right? right. Whatever team needs, if you want to get to a higher level, you better start, accept the role, do the best you can. And, um, you know, leave it out there on the ice. Cause no, every coach, no coach will be, uh, if you're a hard worker, every coach loves a hard worker. Yeah. That's a choice. You know, you can work hard. So go out there and, you know, lay it out there the best you can. And that was your approach? That was my approach, yeah. 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 Yeah, I remember a, a conversation with Jason Krog came to mind. And maybe maybe he was in it. Was he in Atlanta with you? He was up and down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, he actually, because it was Hartley that he, he told the story about. And he was leading the IHL in points at the time, right? And he yeah. just came off an MVP season. Uh, yep. older guy as well. I mean, Hobie, he had a, he had a resume, right? Hobie Baker. Yeah. 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 And, um, and he got called up by Atlanta a few times and he, he says he told a story, which I thought was awesome where he, he got, uh, put on the power play, but he was a net front guy. Right. So he's like, I've never been net front guy in my life. You know? I don't yeah. even know what I was supposed to do. And here I'm standing in front of the net and getting cross yeah. yeah. off the back. And, and, yeah. goes, and a part of me was like resentful almost that like that this is where I was. And like, so his story was, was meant not to be like, that was what he should have done, but like he wishes that he was more accepting and just doing mm-hmm. the best he could with what was asked of him. Right. So that resistance yeah, yeah. of like, why am I here doing this actually hurt him? Right. Because he wasn't doing the best job he could in that moment. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's yeah. super powerful because a lot of us get caught up in that resistance mode, right? Like why, why am I the third line right winger? I should be second or first. And then like you yeah. in, in that thought process, you, you're not doing the best you can for yourself or for the team because mm-hmm. you don't, right. You're, you're not fully invested. So yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway, that was a powerful story. And I mean, and, and, and vice versa, you're saying that you were a guy that just bought in and I'm sure that did nothing but help you not only on the ice, but in the eyes of your coach, right. And then with respect to your teammates. Yeah. And I think that actually helped me too, in regards to, uh, you know, after that year in Boston, now here, I got a two year deal with the Philadelphia Flyers, you know, I was now I'm a decent penalty killer. I played with the Bruins, you know, a hard worker. And then I, I got my two year deal and that was kind of a, it didn't end up doing, you know, it ended up working out better in the end. I go to Montreal, but that was a tough place to go. They had a salary cap issues and injuries, and it was just a, it was, that was a different beast. Philly? Really. Yeah, just playing yeah. with the Flyers, just the town, the city. Um, the dressing room, the culture was a little bit weird, the different, you know, younger younger guys that were the, were the glue were the younger guys that, I, I want to say they're focused, but they, they had other, stuff going on too. It was just like, man, okay, this is this is wild. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What um we're coming up in the sixty minutes so we're right here and I want to respect your time, but I do want to ask you about about the Canadians and maybe because I, I like the transition points, right? Like what happens for guys. You know, you've been an NHL yeah. now for a while. Uh, you found a role, like you said, that get, got you a two to your uh, deal somewhere. Mm-hmm. You end up in mm-hmm. Montreal and you have your most offensive well, at least from goal standpoint, you score 16 yeah. in Montreal, right? You score, score yeah, 16, yeah. you get, get 30 points, and then you never play in the NHL again. Like, how how did that happen? And, and was that a was there was there no off yeah. deals available, or like what? Walk me through how that all worked out. Well, um, so back to the Philadelphia Flyer. Uh, so I skate in the morning. John Stevens pulls me over. Was, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, salary caps and stuff like that. Ford's coming back, Danny Breer, uh, Kimo Timonen. in. Um, and uh, John Stevens like, hey, Metro, uh, I'm sure you're aware, but you're going to be put on waivers. And I, I feel like there's a good chance a team might grab you. Um, be ready to play tonight, you know, and, um, you know, we'll see what happens. So I, I get I get off shower. I'm looking at my phone. Look, okay, shit, what, you know, what's going on? You know, I eat, go home, get some sleep. I get a call. It's uh, Bob Ganey. Bob Ganey calls me Montreal Canadiens. He's like, uh, Metro and his, you know, I can't do the French accent, but 
Anyway, he, he said, uh, Matt, we're, we're so happy to have you on our team. You know, we picked you off waivers. We claimed you. Um, I think you're going to be a great addition for us. Uh, Dee Carbonell is going to be calling you our head coach. Um, so be aware. Dee Carbonell calls me. Hey, Metro, uh, you know, great having you. I loved watching you play. Uh, congratulations. Uh, you're, you're, you're had now. Um, they're in town playing Philadelphia at night no. in Philadelphia. So I skated in the morning with Philadelphia and oh, he's oh. like, yeah, he's like, Hey, uh, I understand you. If you don't want to play tonight. You know, I'm like, are you serious? Yeah, I want to play. Let's let's stick it up the Flyers' ass, you know. So, anyway, I, I walk. You know, my my wife at the time drops me off in my suitcase because I'm heading back to Montreal with the team after the game. So I walk by, I walk by all the security guards in Philly, some of the guys, right down to the room, and here I am. You know, I got a my number fifteen jersey hanging up in the stall. I'm sitting beside George LaRock, <laughs> and we're going up to play. Starting lineup: Kovalev, Metropolit, uh, and Koivu. So, so I was like, you know, during warm up, I'm looking at Scotty Hartnell and, you know, Lupo and all my buddies, right? Mike Richards and what, what a game that was. So anyway, long story short, so I'm going back to Montreal. And then um, that summer comes around. Um, we end up picking up a lot of good guys July 1st. Um, you know, uh, Scott Gomez, uh, Hal Gill, um, Gionta. They make a big splash, bring in, bring in a lot of guys. Jacques Martin's the head coach now. Yeah. Um, now I feel like, okay, we, we have a chance. Um, I feel like I'm part of the team. We have a great year and, um, I'm in it. You know, I'm, I'm off the power play. I'm on a power play. Patch a rookie. So I, I, I led the team in power play goals that year too. I had 10 goals, but I wasn't even a fixture. I was like, I was in front of the net back to your point with Jason Krog. Yeah. I had to learn how to hit the D man before he hit me so I could deflect the puck. You know, I was fighting for that area too, but I didn't have no idea. Right. So yeah. Um, it was a skill that I had to learn. Um, I worked at it, um, had a great year of power play. And then we made the run to the conference finals. Um, here I am 35, right? Jay, it's, it's a younger, it's a younger man's game. Now I'm a third liner. Um, I had, I had an offer in the summer to go to Anaheim for one year. And at that time I was just, I didn't want to move the family. I was like, I don't want to go one year and, you know, waivers or, you know, younger guys taking my job. And here I am, you know, I'm out in California with the kids and, so we, we decided on going uh, going to Switzerland for two years, kids international school and yeah. um you know, did two years in zoo, two years in Lugano and uh, two years in Mannheim. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, nuts, crazy. It's but you know crazy. I had my best year, you know, when I was thirty five. Right. So, and your last but, year, which is so yeah, crazy yeah, too. Yeah, um, yeah. But Super wild. The, the one thing I wanna I wanna point out, I, what year was it? 2012, 2013. So you're in Lugano. Yeah. And um, was that another lockout year or something? Because, uh, like, what's Patrice Bergeron doing there? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that was another lockout year. Yeah. Ber, uh, Berge came, played in Lugano with me. Yeah. So, for those listening, like, and I, I just love Hockey DB because you can sniff around and find <laughs> some stuff. But so, Patrice Bergeron at 27 comes to the Swiss A League during the lockout year. Glenn Metropolis, 38. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Bergie, Bergie had 29 points in 21 games by all counts an NHL future Hall of Famer and you had 64 points that year in 50 games so like that's uh, that's a testament to the player you obviously are and, and were yeah. in your entire career I think that's pretty special <laughs> yeah um, I mean, yeah I got to play with him when he was there he was on the line but Ber Bergie what a what an ultimate professional you know back, back to cultures and stuff like that with teams uh, I got to go back to the Boston Bruins where so Dana was our captain, Chara and Bergeron. And I remember first day of camp, I, I kind of, you know, our, our whole focus was, you know, stop in front of the net, you know, for rebound. I remember just curling off to the corner, lazy. And I remember big, uh, big Z comes up. He's like, Metro, you got to stop in front of the net. And it just really stuck with me, the leadership that he had in Bergeron. And, um, I just had to come back to that. You know what I mean? Just, it's the details, you know, right. at, at that level, it's the details and, um, you know, he was a great captain. I had a lot of great captains, but Big Z was a good one. So Bergeron, he was just a natural leader. I've heard nothing but good things about him. I had Sean Thornton awesome. on uh, as a guest, oh, Thornton. and um, Thornton yeah. was uh, he was a teammate of mine on the Rock there, and obviously he went on to win two <laughs> cups and you know have yeah. a great NHL career. And um, yeah. he couldn't say yeah. enough good things about about Bergeron and and, yeah. and that culture that, that that those guys had. Like, what would be the? You know, I mean, you mentioned details, like. It, 
I, in my experience with with teams that you know that have done well or that I've even felt comfortable with, and I think that's a big thing too, right? Does everyone on that team feel comfortable and like they're supposed to be there and they're contributing, right? Like I think when everyone yeah. has that feeling, like you're gonna you're gonna have good results. Um, mm. And it feels kind of like a, you know, the, the word family gets overused, but it really does genuinely yeah. feel like some type of brotherhood, some type of family. Like, what, was there anything there yeah. like, in that environment that you saw that just like the way they did things was a little different or or, or encouraged that type of behavior? Um, I, I think back back to the team atmosphere, the family part, I think it's really important to, as I get into coaching, just really make sure everyone has a, has a role and feels important with the team. You know right. what I mean? It's not... I think that's so important. And the teams that I've won on, I, as I think back and reflect on how the team was, the dressing room, the leadership group, you know, they, they were, the core was great. Um, but everyone had a role and felt like they're contributing. Yeah. So even if, you, if you're playing your five, six minutes a night, they knew they had that, comp, you know, that, that the conversation with the coach, hey, this is your role, either you accept it or we'll get someone else. But the guys that accepted it, being the best penalty killers, best guys, that, those are the teams that I won championships with. We're having great years, you know, getting close. Montreal, the Canadians, you know, we went to conference finals. Right. Everyone accepted the roles, and it was a tight group, a really tight group. And like you say, and 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 those roles were celebrated. Like that was one thing that, again, just the conversation mm-hmm. with Brad, our first conversation is just ringing in my ears, and, and he he was that six, seven, eight minute a night guy, right? Yeah, 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 he was. I think he, I think he call, classified himself as you know an energy guy. He was supposed to go out there, provide some <laughs> energy, get some hits, and he said like in that role. Forsberg would come to him at the after the game, or Blakey, or Sackick, or whoever, mm-hmm. right, and and make him feel like those seven minutes were vital to their to their win that night. You know, like yeah, yeah, you know, and he and he said that that doesn't happen all the time, right? So him in mm-hmm. those seven minutes, he felt like he was a piece of that puzzle, right? Where very yeah, 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 and other yeah. teams, he he could feel left behind or not included or not important, right? And and I think that's where. Um, you know, for those listening and you want to be, you want to be a leader, or if you're in a position where you're getting a lot of minutes, you know, just be a good human being, right? Like be, yeah, a, be yeah. a good human, right? Like be outside yourself and, and, and let other people know that they're valued. And again, grateful, right? Grateful for for their contribution. And, and yeah, wow, yeah. I mean, big things can happen in that environment. Well, I just realized too, those guys are just as important as the guys that are scoring goals, right? You know what I mean? Those guys, they're a big part of the puzzle, right? They're blocking shots, they're eating pucks. They're doing what they have to do, right? Um, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I'm trying to really focus in on now that I'm the assistant coach role over here, right? I'm I'm really watching a lot of videos with the guys, and I've been fortunate enough where I can try to watch video with them. And through my eyes, with all the roles that I've played, what I see, what he could have done differently, or, you know, or, or and we talk about it, we discuss it, and we, I let him know. Don't, don't, don't be down. The coach knows your value to, for the team. And I just try to lift them up because I know how I felt, you know, because I've been through every situation. Right. So, um, but I'm really, I'm really enjoying that, that part of the game as well, you know, yeah. being able to be there. It's a fine line though, right? I'm, and I'm with the coaching staff. I'm just trying to find my way. I'm trying to be authentic as I can be, yep. be open with them and just let them know I do care. I care for them and I want the best for them. And ultimately that's going to be the best for our team. Yeah, I think that's super well said, and I think that that's that is 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 a part that I think was missing during our run, or at least mine. Yeah. You know, I left I left a little earlier than you, but it was starting yeah. to transition, and just meaning like the the care factor. You, you use the word use the word asset. I think earlier, you know, some teams you were an asset, and other teams you were a human being that would happen to be a hockey player. You know, and right. yep. and I think we remembered both sides of it, right? The the places where you felt cared for, you know, and and there is a little bit of empathy, and 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 you were allowed to be human. You remember those inter those interactions and those coaches because damn, you wanted to play well for them, and that's the one thing with mm-hmm. I remember with Bruce Boudreaux, who like has a job again, and mm-hmm. like. I don't want to demean Bruce Boudreau because there's nothing to demean, but he was not the best X's and O's guy that I, he was really, he didn't rank up there even close, but what he yeah, did yeah. do great was made you feel welcome. And he made you feel important as a person, right? He was in, he was interested in me. He was interested in his players, right? And because mm-hmm. he was interested, I felt that he built that trust and you wanted to go to bat for him. You know, you wanted to play well for him. Um, yeah. So it, it's just interesting. I think that that's where coaching is headed. And, and I think the more the more players are 
feel valued, the more they feel trusted, um, the more they're going to give. You know, it's not just the jump how high, uh, jump and they yeah, say yeah, how yeah. high anymore, right? When it was you and I. Yeah, right? yeah. They, yep. they got to buy in. So I think that you're, you know, and not that you need my endorsement, but I think you're doing it the right way, definitely, right? Like by caring about these guys, you care about them and they're going to feel it, you know, and then they're going to give you more. Yeah, and th- I think too, Jay, with with us growing up in, in our hockey adventures too, uh, the the assistant coach were were really big big people, part of my growth. You know, those were the guys that I leaned on, I talked to, and I remember how important they were to me. You know, not necessarily the head coach. You know, what I mean, They're, they kind of they were the the figure. You know, what I mean, back to your points, X's and O's and stuff. I mean, Kirk Muller was that for me in Montreal, and I can go on. You know, down in the minors, it was uh, Glenn Hanlon, but it was just. The guys that stood out and helped me was the with the assistant coaches that you could bounce stuff off of and know that they could trust you and you can help them and they earn your respect. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, the one I remember sure. too is Lindy Ruff. Lindy was Lindy was always the guy that would stay out after practice when I was in Florida, and you know he'd be the yeah. one working on your game with you, and he'd also be the guy yeah. that was on the plane and he'd be playing cards with us at the back of the plane. And I don't know if yeah. the coaches can do that anymore uh, or not. Yeah. You know, he was definitely that, you know, the intermediary between the head guy, right? And and there was a yeah. comfort level that you could have with those guys that you didn't uh, otherwise. But um, mm-hmm. you had to trust him, right? That's the whole thing with yeah. that. Is like you got to feel like if you're on guard all the time as a player and you're not sure, you know, what the motive is or where this is coming from, like you kind of yeah. were always checking over your shoulder, weren't you? Like at least I felt I like I was. Like I, I was never really like in an environment where I was like, okay, I feel good here, you know, like I feel yeah, yeah. comfortable. Um, yeah. Boy, when, when you do find that, that's probably when you play your best hockey. Yep. I had that in Boston. I had that in Montreal, you know, I, I, I say Washington, Glenn Hanley, but he was that for me down in Portland, Maine, you know, but up in NHL, it was, um, you know, Tim Army and uh, Tim Hunter. They're kind of, Tim Hunter was still kind of old school, assistant coach, old school. Yeah. And then Tim Army, uh, yeah, uh, it just it, it, he was just assistant coach there type thing, you know. But um, do you have but any, yeah, like you uh, said, a couple, yeah. a couple just to, to end off, and I always I, and I sometimes I forget and I get mad. But like you mentioned, the coaches that had an impact. Any players? Cause I, I think the players sometimes forget, regardless of what spot they are in their career, whether you're an older guy or whether you're even just an older guy in a junior team, right? That you you can really impact and have a positive impact lasting impact on others is, is there anyone that you remember through your pro career or otherwise um that that really influenced you and and, and helped guide you well i have so many it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint one i just remember some of the leaders like scott mellenby even though i was in um in atlanta he was another captain i was just uh salt to the earth invite you out for dinners on the road where you felt like uh you know you're the, you know, you're not that guy you know but yeah. um he really stuck out my mind. Um, there's been great teammates, Sean Thornton. You know, the year when you feel like you're part of a team, that those are the years you remember the most. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, uh, and what are those Montreal. gestures? I mean, I remember Thirty talking about that, and, and he said that 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 idea was really important to him. So he al- he almost put it upon himself to make sure that that you know that, that there was a nucleus, or not even a nucleus, but a, but an overall general feeling of inclusion, right? That he, he went out of his way to make sure that guys, yeah, yeah. That, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Is that is it as is it as simple as that? Like somebody inviting somebody for for lunch? Uh, is it those small gestures? Yeah, man, it all adds up, right? You get to know each other, each other better, right? But yeah. um, but the game's changing too. I think it's like everyone's kind of like the old. They all just separate. I, I've been fortunate enough here this year where. We've had we're in this Champions League game, so we're forced to go to different countries and have some time together. So it's really helped our team here. But besides that, it's usually guys are just they leave right away. Right. So the game's changed a little bit that way. Yeah. I remember um, I told a story actually just to some uh, in this this uh, culture class that I did the other day for some coaches here locally, and I, I told the story of, like the last the last NHL camp I went to was the Detroit Red Wings. Right? So I, I played in Germany. Uh, I ended up going to Japan and uh, and kind of got that passion and my, my my zest for hockey back again and kind of believed in myself again. I'm like, I should be in the NHL. Like, I, I got to give this another another kick at that. Yeah. That was where my belief was at. And and uh, yeah. Mike Babcock was a coach in Detroit at the time. And Ken Holland was a local guy here in Vernon that was the GM. And um, yeah. got my agents, talked to them, had some personal conversations. Yeah, I want you to come to camp, right? Come to camp. We'll give you an honest, we'll give you an honest shot. And yeah. um 
anyways, I ended up getting hurt there, you know, like second day of, of camp, and I ended up playing one exhibition game. And I, although I still think I probably could have made it, I couldn't make it at sixty percent. That's for sure. So it just didn't work out, yeah. right? But, mm-hmm. but the 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 story is that I walked in like this was at a point in my career where no one knew who who I was, right? Like I, I wasn't an AHL goal scoring leader anymore. I wasn't a second rounder. I wasn't a world junior gold medalist, right? Like I was a you know, yeah. I was I was not a prospect. I was a suspect, right? So, like, I yeah, walked into yeah. that environment, this this perennial winning Stanley Cup type environment, and no one knew who I was. And like the very first day in the locker room, Chris Chelios walks across the locker room to you know this thirty year old guy sitting there and invites me out to his ch- chili bar in Detroit. Right? He wants to come take yeah, a yeah. chili bar. And um and from that moment, like it was the most impressive experience as far as like feeling like what culture feels like in a place where you feel comfortable, you feel mm-hmm. like you can be a contrib- contributor, you feel valuable. Yeah, yeah. And it was like that the whole time from Thomas Holstrom inviting me to golf to Dominic Hasek sitting at the front of the bus talking my ear off for 30 minutes to, you know, yeah. like, it was just throughout the organization, these guys were good people. I mean, and really, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, they were, and they were about each other, not about themselves. And, um, and I just loved, like, I just loved, like that was my last impact because in other places it wasn't like that, as we already talked about. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. non-playoff teams, teams that were divided, teams who had little clicks. You know, older guys, younger guys. Detroit was not like that at all. And um, and really, it boiled down to the people and the interactions. So I mean, I, I just check your that. ego at the door, right? Check your yeah. ego at the door. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There yeah, was, yeah. Play- I mean, I'm sure you saw that too. Like there was teams that I was on. I won't name any names, but like, you know. I'm a third line right winger and there's no way the second line right winger is helping me with anything like getting the pucks off the wall or asking me a question or, you know, showing me a 10 year guy. Cause I'm, I could take his job and that was his, and I understood yeah. that, right. It's pro hockey, but in Detroit, yeah. like that, guess who Maltby and, and Draper are working with Darren Helm. Right. Yeah. How to do face-offs. You know what I mean? Like it was yeah, just yeah, a different, yeah. it was a different feeling there about what it took to win. Right. And those guys knew that they, you know, there was a spot. Kenny would have a spot for him. You know, like they were going to get taken care of as long as they took care of the group. And uh, and boy, yeah. you know, an eighteen year old Darren Helm walking in there, feeling comfortable is a hell of a lot different place to break into the league than everyone kind of pushing you out, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah. I felt that at an older age too. There was a few guys in Washington where uh, I'm, I'm so happy. My my first game. I'm in. Uh, Played in Buffalo. I scored on Hasek my first exhibition game. You know, my family from Toronto comes in. I told uh, a certain guy in the room, hey, I can't find the PR guy, but I know the bus is leaving to go to the airport to to go back to Washington. But I got to see my mom and see my family. You know, he's like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'll, I'll hold the bus for you. I'll tell the guy. Sure enough, no one comes and gets me. I go back. The bus is gone. It's gone to the airport. I Bill Zito's there. Bill Zito, my agent. He's like, what the fuck? You know, what the buzz, right? Yeah. He drives me out there. I rush out there. I get on the plane. I'm like, I just I was like, oh, man. So to, back to your point, right? And he was a forward. But yeah. but yeah, I would man. never do that. I would never do that. I, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I, I was I was always a guy wanting wanting to help our teammates. Um, I, felt, I never felt threatened. I always wanted what was best for the team. Yeah. And, you know, and that, that goes, you put just bringing good people. Yeah. You know, if you're a good hockey player, good, good, do do your research and go find the good people. Bring, yeah. bring in good people. What a great way to end. I mean, I, I mean, I think that's a great way to stop. We've already gone over, mm-hmm. but I think that's such an awesome lesson. And 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 it's a lesson because yeah, you're a good hockey player, buddy. But I mean, you play till you're 41, and you don't do that being mm-hmm. an asshole. Yeah. yeah. No, but for real, well, right? Like, I don't you know. don't. Yeah. I mean, you don't yeah. because because the. <laughs> hockey world's small enough that people know right and you can get by in talent for so long but you can't have you can't have a 22 year career and, and be like that i mean you got to have other people uh think about other people first and you know be a good human as we've been talking about and and yeah. uh boy i'm just so i'm such a champion for for creating good little humans who like want to be good humans and want to help each other out because when i'm talking with these coaches now and these scouts like because culture isn't a buzzword anymore and they're really, really trying to create good locker rooms, right. With repairing <laughs> good locker rooms, like it's a competitive advantage, man. Like for sure. A competitive advantage on an individual level to actually care about other people, you know, and uh, gives you more chances, gives you a longer career. 
Um, you know, there's so many things that happen to it. But again, it has to be authentic. But I do think it could something that can be learned. You know, like it has to be authentic. Yes. But I do yeah. think it's something that can be learned because we're usually so worried about ourselves. You know, and our where we're at and where our development is and you know how many points i got last night like that's the that's the natural tendency but we can get outside of that man like mm -hmm. it, it really does open up a lot of opportunity so thank you for ending yeah, with that okay. i think that's fantastic you've been an amazing guest i love your story uh always been a massive fan metro and um yeah, and i love what you're doing there so thanks so much for being here i appreciate it keep doing a great work tj thanks boss see you guys Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of our conversation. I really thought that that conversation built momentum as we went. Uh, I hadn't recorded in a while, and I kind of felt myself off a little bit at the beginning. Uh, but I really thought that we we started to 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 move and shake through that interview um, with with Glenn. His story uh, it's it's really remarkable. Like I I, I can't. I can't say that enough, like how being in that environment, being in an AHL environment and uh, and me never having played in the U United Hockey League or the East Coast Hockey League, none of these, I guess you would call lower tiered professional leagues. Uh, I only saw it through the lens of an AHL uh player and I would see the guys that would either have PTOs or, or two-way deals from the AHL to the East Coast League and or that would get up and get called up from the East Coast League if somebody was hurt and it is hard it's it's hard enough to get from the AHL to the NHL and become a regular but to get out of the East Coast Hockey League or the United Hockey League or, where, or wherever the, uh, some of these players go to be, to establish yourself as an AHL guy because there's so many players that are under NHL deals that these these teams have invested money and they've invested time and in resources and, and they want their players to be the ones that are the players for them in the future, whether it be at the AHL level or the NHL level. And to be an undrafted guy, to be a free agent, to just be so good that you have earned your spot in the next place and then in the next place, uh, it's... I mean, like I said, I, I just I just can't say enough about what Glenn was able to accomplish, and, and at the age he was able to accomplish it. I mean, to be able to do what he did in his 30s, uh, to become an NHL regular and have NHL one way deals, like it, it's so impressive to me. Uh, his longevity and his persistence and his, uh, his his he just wouldn't go away. You know, he had to be so consistent. Uh, to make that happen because there's so many people lining up telling him that he's not good enough or telling him that, oh, I knew he wasn't ready or this or that. He's not getting second chances. So what an amazing, inspiring story, not to mention where he came from, uh, you know, as far as the projects, as he called it, from, from, a, from a single uh, parent home in and out of foster homes. We, we didn't talk about his brother. And I mean, I guess the cat's, cat's out of the bag at this point because I just mentioned it. But his brother spent 16 years in jail. Same environment, right? One, one guy ends up in the NHL being a pro hockey player. One guy ends up in jail. And we didn't even get into that. And, and, and Glenn actually mentioned off the air that, geez, we didn't even talk about that. Maybe that's for part two. So, like, I... I, I Tried to dive in there, and I think we did a pretty good job of covering that and the choices that, that Glenn was forced with and the choices that he was able to make in really hard times and in really hard moments that kept his head above water and kept him enough on the straight and narrow to allow himself the opportunity to have this hockey career. But we all have choices, right? We're not all from the projects. We're, we're, we're not all from single-family homes, and, and some of us are, are from, from families that, that are... That, that have good sources of income and there's a roof over our heads and we know we're safe and we're know we're protected, but we always have choices on an individual level about how we are going to pursue our goals and our dreams. And the more that we can dial those choices in to support our goals and dreams, the better we are. And that is one thing that I'm super passionate about helping players with. And for Glenn, he was, he was holding the compass in his own hand. He had to make these choices seeing these things around him that were normal. A lot of his life was normalized from where, he, where, where his upbringing was. But he chose to make different options. He chose a different direction. And, and I just find that really, really inspiring as well. You know, to, to, to get to where he got to from his humble beginnings um, is an absolute 
fantastic story, and I hope it's one that really motivates young players out there. And and we use that word gratitude a lot during the during the podcast, but, but to be grateful of your situation, to be grateful for what you have in front of you, the team you're able to play on, the skates you're able to put on your feet, the practice that you get to go to. Um, you know, for for Glenn, he was he was playing for years without a real team, for years without a real team. Grateful for sleeping at essentially the bus driver's feet on the stairs of the bus, being a healthy scratch, right? Finding gratitude in those moments uh, is, is a powerful, powerful tool. So remember, what you make of the moment, the meaning you give whatever moment you're going through uh, in your life or in your hockey journey, there is a choice that's going to help align with your goal of being a player, and there's going to be a personal choice that's going to take you off track. That's going to get you farther away from that goal. So do your best to help align. Do your best to work on that inner circle. Get the support that you need. And, uh, and yeah, keep fighting. Play hard, everybody. And keep your head up.